Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar here around college success for those living with disabilities. So I want to start off by saying who I am. My name is Jamil Payton. I am the Christopher and Dana Reeves Foundation Racial Health Equity Manager. My role here at the organization is to ensure that when we plan all our programs, we want to do it equitably and ensure that everyone has an opportunity to participate. Today, we are here to share information for students on this amazing college day called Decision Day. For those that made their decision already, we want to help you as you transition. For those thinking about what school to go to, this webinar will be here to help you. So we have some amazing panel panelists here, and I want to make sure that we give them the best opportunity to introduce themselves. So to my virtual left, I have Annie Tolkien. She is the founder and director of Accessible College. I have below her on my screen, Ann Natler, Dr. Ann Natler, excuse me, <laughs> Delaware State University. Um, she is, just so I'm not messing up your title, <laughs> she is the director for Center of Disability Resources at Delaware State University. And I have here to my virtual bottom, Miles Washington, who is a student at UC Berkeley, class of 25. And with that, I wanna allow them the opportunity to describe themselves and discuss who they are. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Natler. Please tell everyone who you are. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Nettler, um, and like Jamil said, I am the director for the Center for Disability Resources, and I'm the ADA and 504 Compliance Officer at Delaware State University. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, in terms of a description of myself, I am a tall Caucasian female. I have long, dark hair um, and dark brown eyes. I'm wearing um, a black shirt and a gray wrap. And I'm here to talk with you about what that transition looks like so that everyone can begin um, with the attitude of success. Jamil, I'll I can jump right in. I was um, going to say, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Cool. Um, I'm Annie Tolkien. I am the founder and director of Accessible College. Um, at Accessible College, I support students with physical disabilities, so mobility device users, wheelchair users, ambulatory wheelchair users, and so on. And I also support students with chronic health conditions with the college search transition process and preparation process. And I have a partnership with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation where students with any type of paralysis can work with me for free for up to three hours. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. Um, and just a description of myself, I am a white woman wearing glasses. I have a funky asymmetrical haircut. I guess that's how I describe it. And I'm wearing a green sweater and I will toss it over to Miles so he can introduce himself. Hello, yes, my name is Miles Washington. I am a student with a disability. Physical disability is quadriplegia. I injured my spinal cord um, playing college football about 10 years ago as of April 13th, it's very, very, uh, the anniversary was pretty recent. Um, I, after spending time away from college, I decided to go back to community college. And then from there, I transferred to UC Berkeley where I'm here trying to um, get my undergrad degree in political science. Thank you so much for that. And really appreciate you all sharing. And one of the amazing things that we're going to do today is really allow our panelists to discuss their reasoning for being a part of this webinar of expertise. The goal is to ensure that you have as much information that is needed so that you can be successful in college. So without further ado, let's transition to Dr. Nadler 
and she can provide us some slides around what you should do once you are really ready to talk to um, the departments around disability in the schools. Wonderful. So I just shared my slides for everyone. Um, and the main points that I'm gonna bring up for you today are what you need to do when you're preparing, um, the college search, admission and beyond, and then that first semester. I always like to share, um, sometimes when you are a student with a disability and you're thinking of going to college or you're at college, um, there can be this sense that I'm gonna be the only one. Um, and that could not be further from the truth. Um, in this country, uh, on average, 19% of all college students have a disability, 19%. That's an awfully large population. Um, we all know that disability is just another aspect of diversity. Um, at Delaware State University, where I am from, um, diversity is one of our core values and we see diversity at its core being defined as difference. Um, and disability is just another layer of that um, culture that we celebrate. It's something anyone can become a member of at any time. And at DSU, we are proud to say that our numbers of students with disabilities are through the roof. In the last um, six years, we're up 647%, which means something is working. So the preparation, what do I need to know before I start my college search? One, the difference in the law is very important. So when a student is in K-12, so elementary school, middle school, high school, the biggest law that protects them is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA. You may have heard that before. Um, or Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So students often have an IEP or a 504 plan if they happen to be a student with a disability. An accommodation that someone receives under an IEP or a 504, based on the law that protects students in K-12, the accommodation has to guarantee that that student will be successful no matter what. Um, in higher education, in employment, the Americans with Disabilities Act and its amendments is the law that offers the most wide reaching protection for people with disabilities. An accommodation under that law must guarantee equal access, which means the same opportunity as everyone else to be successful or not successful. So K-12, guaranteed success. Higher education, employment, and everything after that, guaranteed equal access. I'm not going to go through all of these details, but I want to give you just some examples of the differences between high school and college. So in high school, um, the school is responsible for identifying a person with a disability um, and for proactively reaching out and providing them with accommodations. In college, you, the student, are the one who is responsible for reaching out to an office like mine, the Center for Disability Resources, and notifying us to say, hey, identify as a person with a disability and I'm going to need accommodations. In high school, um, the day is structured. You know, there's, there's first period and then you have structured time from the time you get there until the time you go home. Um, and in college, it's kind of the reverse. You have so much unstructured time. Um, you might be in class three hours of the day and you may have the rest of that day um, where you don't have classes, but you still need to be taking ownership of your time so that you are getting your homework done, that you're completing assignments, because there's more responsibility on the student for their academic learning in college than there is in high school. Um, also in high school, um, some accommodation plans or 504s, IEPs, they may have accommodations on them that might modify educational programs. Um, that, comes, that comes in again with that guaranteed success of those accommodations. In college, the student, every student with or without a disability has to meet the same learning outcomes as everybody else, which means you take the same tests, you write the same papers, um, you study for the same things, you participate, you go to class, just like everybody else. So from high school to college, this is so key. The accommodations do not transfer. So whether you have an IEP or a 504, neither one of them follow you to college. Don't panic. 
You can absolutely request accommodations in college. That's why offices like mine exist at every single institution of higher education. Uh, we are a federal mandate. We have to be there. Um, and we want you to contact us to request accommodations. Um, accommodations from high school might look exactly the same in college. There might be accommodations that were from high school, but that wouldn't be quite reasonable in college. So there might be some alternatives that exist. And at the same time, there could be accommodations that you are offered in college that you were never even offered in high school. Um, it's just a new educational environment, but nothing transfers over. Oftentimes I hear from students or parents um, who have been perhaps just a little misadvised um, and they think that, you know, if it's a 504 plan, it will transfer, or if it's an IEP, it will transfer. And that's just not the case because the law is different. So under the Americans with Disabilities Act, that most overarching federal piece of legislation that protects people when they are a college student, the definition of a disability is someone with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits what are more daily life activities? So what does that mean? Uh, that means eating, sleeping, breathing, thinking, learning, concentrating, walking, talking, sitting, standing. Um, there is no exhaustive list. And if someone meets that definition, they're considered a part of a protected class. You're protected from retaliation. You're protected from discrimination. You have to be otherwise qualified. That's an important phrase. And it means that every student in college gets in based on the exact same admissions requirements. Um, so whether they have a disability or not, everybody has to meet the same GPA or SAT, ACT, extracurricular, whatever those requirements are, everyone has to meet the same ones. Um, and the same thing in their classes, everyone meets the same academic requirements. Um, you can also be entitled to reasonable accommodations, just like you are when you're in high school. Um, so in college, a reasonable accommodation is an adjustment that removes a barrier that's preventing you from having equal access. It could be in your classes. It could be with a specific program. It could have to do with any touch point of that institution that you're attending. Um, and it has to do that without fundamentally altering the learning outcomes of a course or a program. So what do you wanna consider when you're looking for a college? What are important things that we might not think of right off the bat, but that a student who has a disability might wanna think about? What's the size of the institution? Um, do you wanna to go to a big school or a small school? Um, the location, especially for students who have any sort of mobility impairment, um, is the university or the college built on a hill? Um, if so, that might be something to consider. Um, is it in the middle of a city? Are you someone who would benefit from being able to access a good mass transit system? Um, if so, being in a more urban setting could be helpful because usually they have better mass transit options. Um, what are their admission standards? Um, can you meet the admission standards? That's something that any student searching for a college would wanna look at. And what about overall accessibility? Um, have you been on the campus? Could you take a tour? Uh, whether it's physical access, what do their passive access look like? What do the passive travel look like? Um, how accessible are their buildings or are their dorms? Um, this, this information could be on the college's website. You might be able to find it um, by talking to their disability office. Um, and you would certainly find it if you are going for a tour. Um, but what about accessibility in other ways? Access to accommodations, electronic access. Um, those are all things that you really want to think about. Um, if you're someone who tends to have more medical appointments or you need to be close by specific specialists, you want to look for a college or a university that is close to medical providers that would meet your needs. Um, maybe that means it's close to home, or maybe you speak with your medical providers in advance and you say, hey, do you have any areas that you would recommend because I'd be able to find the types of specialists that I might need in that area? Um, you want to know about their disability office at that college. Um, how big is it? How many staff do they have? How responsive are they when you reach out and call or when you send an email? Um, residence halls, do you want to live on campus? If so, where are the residence halls in relation to the academic buildings? How far is it? 
Do you think that might be a problem? Um, what's their plan if there were to be bad weather? Um, what do they, what's their promise to students? How quickly do they clear off roadways or sidewalks? Um, or are you going to school somewhere where it would be a different climate and so bad weather might not affect you as much? Um, and then commuting, if you're going to commute, obviously that would um, put a, a range on the location that you're looking for, um, but what would your commuting look like? Can you do that via mass transit? Um, if you drive, um, can you get there? Um, how far away is it? Thinking that you're thinking that, you know, you'll have to do that commute every day. Um, so you want to make sure you're picking something that is sustainable. So here at Delaware State University, we're really proud um, to be a historically Black college or university. We were founded in 1891. Um, and since then, we have been serving undergraduate students. Now we serve master's and doctoral students as well. Um, we are ranked number two in the nation among all public HBCUs. We are ranked number eight nationally among all HBCUs. Uh, we have so many different majors. We have undergraduate, master's, doctoral, and we have some, some majors that are completely online, some that are hybrid, and most of them are in person. Um, we're a residential and a commuter campus. And we are the first ever HBCU to ever acquire a PWI, which means a predominantly white institution. Um, so we take a lot of pride in the growth and the culture that we have here at Delaware State. Another thing to think about when you're looking at colleges is what sort of resources do they provide? And are they free? And are they for everyone? Um, at Dell State, we have a really great intrusive academic advising program. So all students have to meet with their advisor at least two or three times a semester. We offer peer academic coaches for anyone who would like one. You don't have to have a disability. Um, there's free tutoring in every subject, including online tutoring that is 24-7, 365. Um, everyone gets an individualized development plan, whether or not they have a disability. Um, they offer time management, organizational skills workshops. Take advantage of those. Um, usually in high school, students tend to be a little underprepared for managing time, for organizing their assignments, for breaking down large assignments, frankly, because all of that is kind of done for you in high school. So take advantage of those kinds of skill workshops early on. Um, we offer supplemental instruction sections. Those are sections of difficult classes that can meet again just for review. We have a counseling center that's free for everyone, career center. We have health services. That's another important thing. What does the health services look like in the counseling center if you think that might be important for you on whatever campus that you're considering? So how can I be ready when I get there? You wanna make sure that you connect with the disability office, get updated documentation before you finish high school, locate local providers, finalize any prescription arrangements, like how are you gonna get your prescriptions? Are they gonna be delivered to you? Is there a local pharmacy? Um, if you're someone who might need a personal care attendant, that is something that the student and their family provides for themselves. Um, sometimes a school might help you get connected with different agencies that could assist with that. Um, but that's something you want to think about if that's um, something that's important for you. Think about the food and nutrition. Where are you going to eat? What does the dining hall look like? What sort of technology needs or equipment needs might you have? Um, and make sure you're talking with your advisors. In terms of accommodations in the classroom, I get this question a lot. What could that look like? Well, um, it might be in the classroom itself. It might be where someone sits or taking breaks or note-taking related supports. It might have to do with testing um, in terms of additional time or where someone tests or taking breaks during exams. It might have to do with adaptive technology. There is so much adaptive technology out there. Um, and it is amazing the types of access that can be made possible through technology. And oftentimes that can be part of the student's accommodation plan in college. It has to do with physical access, um, interpreters, sign language interpreters, CART providers. It might have to do with flexibility. Usually that has to do with attendance, housing, dining, any touch point of the institution. And to request accommodations, the general process is that you will fill out some sort of request for accommodations form. That's what we have at Dell State. 
and you'll submit medical documentation. For us, we have that form right online and we have documentation requirements online um, that explain exactly what we need. Someone from my office reviews that information once we get it. We meet one-on-one -on -one with every student and we talk with that student about what it's like to be them as a learner, to be them as someone who's gonna live in, on campus um, because nobody knows you better than you, right? And as a student, you are the one that needs to have that meeting. Um, it's perfectly okay with me if you have a parent or a friend or a guardian sit in that meeting with you, that's perfectly fine. But you, the student, are the one that needs to lead that conversation because you are the adult now. At that meeting, we determine what accommodations a student might qualify for. We explain to you what they are, how you would use them. We answer any questions that you have. We talk about how you'll give your accommodation letter to your professors or email it to them. We make sure that you feel prepared and ready for that start of the semester. So key tips as I close out, things to think about. Who am I as a learner? My whole self, not just my disability, but my whole self. Um, become an active participant now in any IEP or 504 meetings. Start practicing by keeping a calendar, practice speaking for yourself, and reflect on your experiences. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we have some additional fantastic resources for you. And I'm so excited for you to hear from uh, Ms. Tolkien and then from Miles. Yes, thank you so much for providing that information and allowing us to learn more about what the process would look like if we wanted to move for and selecting Delaware State University or any other school. But we're, we're more biased to Delaware State University. We're going to give you that. Obviously. <laughs> but um, I'm pretty partial to myself. <laughs> but we're going to transition to Annie and really allow you to tell us more about your program and the partnership that you have here with Reed. Yep, and as, and as I'm bringing up my screen share right now, I see some Q&A trickling in, which is exciting. So if you have a question, feel free to drop that question into the Q&A so that we will have some time at the end where we'll go through the questions. So if you have that question, um, put it in there now, warm up those muscles. Um, so just, uh, just a little bit of framing for everyone. Um, like Anne, I um, have a disability support office background and um, I used to work as the associate director of the disability support office at Georgetown University. The disability support office there is called the Academic Resource Center. And one funny thing is you'll notice that when you look at different schools, the offices are called different things. It might be disability support services, student disability services, um, it could be a academic resource center or another name altogether. So usually if you go to the college's website and just type in disability services, you can find that website that you're looking for. Um, I wanted to tell you all about a really fantastic project that I've had with the Reeve Foundation um, for the last three years. Um, so in that project, um, I support students with any type of paralysis through one-on-one -on -one consultations for up to three hours. And through the foundation, uh, there's no charge to the student. So all students have to do is connect with the information specialist at the Reeve Foundation to register to work with me. Um, through that project, I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of data and information of what that's looked like over the past three years. Um, so you can kind of see. Um, so paralysis is a big tent term. So any student with any type of paralysis can qualify to work with me for free through this program. It's currently in its third year. Uh, we've had about 54 students, um, and that includes the students I'm currently working with this year. Um, and there's a space for about 30 students per year. And through this project, I've supported high school students who are transitioning to college and also adult learners too with any type of paralysis. So people who are trying to retool or going back to school um, after taking some time off or going back to school after a diagnosis or an injury. Um, and just, just for framing the types, of, the types of conditions that students might have, it could be a spinal cord injury. I've supported students with um, spinal muscular atrophy, muscular dystrophy, 
um, students with Frederick's ataxia, other kind of rare conditions that cause paralysis. Um, so a broad spectrum of conditions. Um, those are the types of students I've worked with. And I put some pictures here um, that are just actually clips from the, the Reeve Foundation website. And the Reeve Foundation, I learned from Jamil earlier, just revamped its website on Friday, which is exciting. Um, and we'll make sure to put in some of these links, but on, under the community section, you can actually, there's now a drop down menu where you can click on Accessible College, and then you can find some of these stories of these student spotlights that um, talk about the students' experience kind of working with me and their transition to the colleges that they chose to go to. Um, so that's really exciting for people to see some of the, the outcomes that students are having and how working with me kind of helped better situate them and support them for moving into college. And some of the things that we, we work with are like thinking through their needs, right? Identifying the types of accommodations that they need. Because one thing that I know now in this position working with students prior to going into college is that once you've seen one disability support office, you've seen one disability support office. Everyone operates a little bit differently. So while the types of accommodations might be similar from place to place, the way in which the accommodations are administered and the care in which they're administered really varies. And some of that depends on capacity. Some of it depends on the mission and values of that university or of that college that you're going to. So it's really important that students start to think about themselves as consumers and looking at and investigating kind of what they are getting into when they're going to college. Um, so a lot of the work I do is supporting students in creating questions for the disability support offices, thinking through their needs, helping them think about continuity of care, some of those transfer of care pieces, how they're setting those things up. So what to expect? If you sign up for this program to work with me for the Reeve Foundation, we usually do a short intake. Sessions are usually one hour. We do them via Zoom. Um, students can have up to three sessions. And then I create some customized planning documents. So it might be a list of accommodations. For some of the students I'm working with um, through the Reeve Foundation, we're also thinking about hiring personal care attendants. And that's something that Ann mentioned is not something that colleges provide. There are only two colleges in the United States that have built in personal care attendant programs. One is the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and the other is Wright State. And they offer kind of different levels of support with their personal care attendant programs. But if the student goes to any other college, community college or any other university in the United States, they have to hire and, and retain and manage their own personal care attendant. So a lot of the work I do with students who need personal care attendants is helping them figure that out. How do I hire? How do I manage? What does that look like? How do I create a job ad? What levers should I be pulling to get the word out? How do I fund those things? So I spend a lot of time with students on that. We create customized documents. And then after every session, I send a little recap to students um, with some to-do lists if there's, if there's um, things that they need to investigate or work on themselves. Um, it's a lot like a coaching relationship. Um, and I just wanted to, Anne talked a little bit about this, but just kind of specific accommodation considerations for students with paralysis beyond some of the typical things, because we need to be thinking about it holistically, especially if a student's living on campus. So you might be asking uh, for, you know, extra time. Priority registration could be a good one for students with physical disabilities and paralysis to ask for so that you have enough time to plan your personal care needs and schedule your day in a way that works best for you. Um, classroom relocation is kind of one that students don't always think about uh, too, whether that's a central location, lower floor. Some classrooms can't be relocated like science labs or things like that, but Hopefully you're, you've found a university that's, that's a good fit, that's willing to work with you to figure out these things. So if you're having an access challenge and you can't get into a building um, in a way that's comfortable or easy for you, that they're willing to navigate that with you. So that's part of that vetting process of the disability support office. Residential accommodations, um, you might be asking for an accessible room. We all know that the ADA is the floor and not the ceiling. Some schools go above and beyond to provide more universally accessible spaces, especially in residence halls. Um, 
people ask me often about Hoyer lifts and things like that. Some schools have built in Hoyer lifts in some of their residence hall rooms. At other schools, you would be expected to bring your own Hoyer lift because that's durable medical equipment and not typically provided as an accommodation. So just, I'm just running through some of the key points here. Um, Accommodations also uh, expand out to recreation. So if you want to be able to swim in the pool, if you want to use the, the gym or recreation facilities, if you're big into esports and e-gaming and there's consoles for every other student to use and you need some adaptive equipment, you could request adaptive equipment. Um, dining hall, it might be around food selection, accessible tables, support in the dining hall. And then programmatic accommodations, which is a big part of college life, going to events. Is the seating accessible? Do you have to wait in line for four hours to get a ticket to something? Um, you know, what are those pieces? If there's sporting events, are they providing accessible transportation to those events so that everybody can get to them? Um, so there's a lot of moving parts beyond what high school students typically have to think about. So I'm just giving you this as sort of a consideration point. So if you uh, want to work with me again, the information here, you can go to uh, ChristopherReeve.org. And it used to be backslash ask, but I'm not sure if that's still the same on the new website. But if you go to the Christopher uh, ChristopherReeve.org website, you can find more information um, on how to connect with the information specialists and asking about working with Accessible College. Um, and then they'll connect you with me. Um, I do have some resources here and I'll share these with Jamil so that he can post them in the in the chat. Um, we've created a guide through the Reeve Foundation called Navigating the Transition to College with Paralysis. It's a it's a um, it's in paper and PDF. So you can check that out. It has some good ideas. I've also written a few pieces for New Mobility Magazine that might be helpful to folks. And United Spinal put out a 20 most wheelchair friendly campuses guide. Um, in 2020 or 2021, that could be a good starting point for a lot of people. And then those college spotlights to um, with the students that I've supported through the Reeve Foundation can also be a good way for people to, to get some information on, on how best to move forward. And I put my contact here. You can find me at accessiblecollege.com. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. But I don't want to talk anymore because I want to introduce my friend Miles Washington and I'm going to stop quickly, my screen share. Quickly before we transition there, I want to make sure everybody know I did place in the chat the okay. link that will take you to our information specialist and they will help direct you to and um, any um, program. Also, if you have any other questions they are there to help you with those also. And go ahead, Ann. Ann. Yeah, um, no, and I and I appreciate <laughs> that. And thanks for putting that in. And if people get totally lost and forget all of these things, you can go to either of our websites and we'll help, we'll guide you in the right direction. Um, so I wanted to bring in Miles. Um, and Miles is a student who I've been working with through this Reed Foundation project. I think Miles for just over a year now, which <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. Um, but I wanted to bring you in and just have you tell us a little bit more about yourself and about that transition to UC Berkeley, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. Well, I'll tell you what, the transition was not easy for two reasons. The general application process for any college student is difficult. It's uh, very tedious depending on how many schools you wanna to go to, uh, researching the schools that cater to your academic needs. And then you have to also think about the, them catering to your disability. Um, and then the other aspect that was difficult was just for me, be, I'm from Los Angeles. So literally living in another city, hundreds of miles away from you know, my birth home and everything and where I've been living uh, ever since my accident is another uh, emotional um, challenge, not just for myself, but really more so for my family. So, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to be honest, it's the main reason why I stayed in California because I did get some um, acceptance 
acceptance letters from New York, and I'm pretty sure that would have freaked everybody out. So I decided to stay in California for for them. You know what I mean? But um, Berkeley is a great um, a great university. It's got a lot of history um, for um, advocating and support for people with disabilities. But it's there's there's a caveat to it. It it was it's that way because people students who were here um, made it so. It wasn't because there was a, you know, a, a moment of kumbaya between the uh, administrators. Um, as, as a matter of fact, we gave the, uh, the administrators a lot of headaches. So, um, and that kind of gets to a lot of my, what I want to talk about in, in terms of um, the college process. And, and once you're able to determine that you're ready, when you're ready to go to school, um, Taking control of your own life is a really big aspect because I first learned about um, accessible college just through scavenging the internet and looking at research and or re different resources. I've always known about the Christopher Reeves Foundation um, since my injury. Uh, it was one of the first stories actually I learned. Um, the super, you know, Superman um, getting injured in a way that is very similar to my injury, you know, being a college football athlete and then having a spinal cord injury. Um, but yeah, when I was, when I've been working with um, Annie yeah, for about a year and uh, she's been a really good coach in helping me understand uh, how to be my own advocate. And I like to call it being my own boss present, not a silent partner. Um, which is what I've probably been, what a lot of people have been, um, you know, with their families taking, your, you know, you're present, but your family is maybe the ones doing the talking in the doctor's office or, you know, um, you, you, the doctor is asking you questions, looking at you, but somebody else is answering the questions for, you know, whatever reason. But at the time um, you decide to go to school, it's really all on you because there's a lot out there that you can access in terms of resources, but you have to be a lot of times willing to seek it out yourself because it won't just drop into your lap. Um, and I would always say to ask as many questions as possible. Um, never shut up, be respectful, but always you know, push for whatever, you know, whatever accommodations you may need. The worst they can do is say no. Um, I'm learning about my accommodations, honestly, every single day. I'm, uh, once you think, you know, once you read all the accommodations that they offer, a lot of it you'll realize is, you know, there's a lot of gray areas where, for example, um, uh, for, for testing or for homework, um, you may need extra time. Uh, for testing, sometimes it's pretty rigid. Sometimes, um, for the most part, it, it's rigid. But if you have a in or something related to your injury, um, if you have low blood pressure, and that's because you're a quadriplegic, and you never know when it comes around, and you forgot to take your medication, so you can get that. You get you. There's accommodations that allow you to um, push that assignment or that test back. Um, Assignments are a lot more gray. They're not as rigid as testing. Um, that is more of a uh, professor-student basis that in terms of the agreements. Um, and hopefully you have professors who are uh, understanding and respectful. So far, I've, I've had, had, had nothing but um, good professors who have always been um, great at understanding, especially this semester, I would say. so. Um, yeah, you're always going to learn something new, um, and at the same time, you you might run into a, a wall that causes you problems while you're at school. Because I guarantee you, you're going to have issues while you're in school. Um, when in, in terms of you know besides the academics, but maybe you have um, an issue with your health, and you need to figure out how to finish the rest of the semester. Um, and, I, and that can be a very um, overwhelming 
feeling, feeling like your disability is taking control of you and may be um, constraining your ability to succeed at college. Um, I learned from a professor who happens to be in a wheelchair. Um, his name is uh, Dr. Christopher Pineda. He is a, uh, um, he works a lot with um, legislation and public policy for at the, um, for, um, the, for the UN. And he was telling me to always advocate for yourself. And if things are causing you to um, have an issue with your schooling or your education and you feel like your academic, he phrased it, how did he phrase it? He said, if you're, if your academic success is in jeopardy, then the school really reacts to that because they want every student to succeed. Doesn't matter if they have a disability or not. Overall, they want you to succeed because you're gonna leave the school and you're gonna tell the story about how the university went. And it's good for um, the university to really show that they are um, supporting students with disabilities and you know it's the way to pay it forward. Um, and um, what else I was going to say? Yes, but so another thing about asking questions, um, these questions are good because it helps you to have an easier lifestyle while you're on campus. Um, when it, and, and it's important not to be shy, even though you might feel uh, reclusive for, for, you know, for whatever reason, um, whether you're naturally introverted or extroverted or um, you were an extrovert and then you turn and then once you got injured, you, you know, kind of held back a little bit and didn't socialize as much. Um, college is a great place for you to reopen yourself and to, um, you know, do a lot of trial and error. Um, again, the worst thing that people can say is no, so long as you're respectful and, you know, um, you're you. Don't forget to be you. It's very important. Um, and um, I have a really good relationship with a lot of the people that I interact with from um, my housing accommodations director to, um, you know, um, um, my DSP advisor um, to my neighbors who are great. Uh, it's important. Eventually you realize that you have a certain network that you communicate with on a um, a general basis. It's a good, it's a good, it's always good to stay in contact with them for um, whatever reason, always stay in communication. That's a, one of the biggest things that I believe helped me. Um, because if you're, you know, if you go ghost and you're, and then um, something happens and you don't say anything, um, you might be able to get by, but for the most part, it's, you know, you might have to accept what you get in the end instead of being proactive, where you have more of a ability to dictate. Um, your needs um, and but um yeah again going going back to um connecting with people i think that um it's important depending on your living situation um it's important to um really get a good connection and good um um, um good community yeah good communication with uh, your neighbors um, there's organizations and groups that you can always um, link up with. You know, you have your classmates who are going to be great for testing or not testing for um, for um, like if you need help with testing or if you need help with homework or anything thing of that nature because uh, you missed a lecture. Um, for the most part, you should be able to have note takers who help you with that. But sometimes, you know, you may not need that. And you just want to, you know, it's a good way to communicate and you know, good excuse to talk to somebody. Um, and also it's important to stay in communication with your friends at home. Um, it's, you know, sometimes you may feel, uh, especially if you're going to a new university in a new state and you're adjusting to the lifestyle, there's so much going on from you um, getting your classes organized, uh, reaching out to advisors, both uh, academic and DSP. Um, it could be a lot when you're looking at all these resources. So um, sometimes it's good to pause, you know, take a step back, 
um, respond to that friend who texted you because they, you know, want to check in on you and see how you're doing. Um, and and I, and I actually did that a lot. I did. I did a, I'm not the best tech um, person at responding to text messages, um, but um, I always respond. I, I always make sure I respond. Um, but um, yeah, I would say it's really important to make sure that uh, is always something that you you, you do and always respond to mom. Miles, if you had like, you just dropped like amazing advice, by the way. <laughs> I'm glad this is being recorded because we're, that's, people are going to need that because you gave, you gave like some huge, huge things that people are going to be really, that are going to be helpful to them as they're like thinking about this next step. But if there was like kind of a, a, a kernel of wisdom that you wanted to pass on to someone who's maybe going to starting college in the fall or starting that college search process now, what would be that like advice that you would have for that person? Well, in terms of um, looking up universities when you're in the process of deciding which schools you wanna to apply to, um, get a good idea of that university's history. Um, I didn't know Berkeley was as hilly as it was because it sits on, you know, when you first arrive, it's on, you know, it's on flat ground. And then once you go deeper into the university, you start to realize, oh yeah, it goes really high up. And then, you know, that could be an issue with uh, wheelchair access. And um, luckily I was able, you know, I was in a space where I was constantly asking questions. So eventually I realized that there's a way you can um, get classrooms removed for or um, moved to a different location so it could be more accessible. And um, another thing I would do is sometimes you don't feel like, you know, it, it personally, if I were in a, if I didn't have a disability, I would put two and two, I could put two and two together that my classroom would be moved because somebody may have a disability. Um, if you are in that kind of mindset where you, you want to be as normal as possible. You want to be like everyone else. I would go to that class, know your class schedule and roam the area because I guarantee you there are, get creative with the way you access that classroom. For example, the class that's on the Hill, first semester I had the classroom moved. Second semester, it was in the same building. I figured out that I can access the class by going into the building adjacent and then going up the elevator and then boom, the street's right there and there's a parking spot um, that's accessible that, and that worked out great. Um, and and the, it, your all schools should, I, don't, I can't say all schools, but um, um, it's a, it would be a good idea to know the area the, where your classrooms are. And then when you're, and the last other nugget I was gonna say was when you're researching or you're going through the application process, um, Look at resources at the same time because I did mine separately. Once I did all my applications, um, and I was, at, and then I was in the wait game where I was just waiting for responses. I didn't f look at resources for you know accommodations and accessibility until after I got my acceptance letters. After once I got once I found out I was going to Berkeley, I was like, oh, well now what? And then, and then, you know, and then it turns into a scramble of you're just trying to find resources. But um, yeah, simultaneously, you should always do that, you know, at the same time. In, the, in those resources, I think like you're talking about like personal care support and, and right. academic resources too. Is that, yeah. Yes, I would definitely say that. Yeah, yeah, that's super helpful. Thanks, Miles. I, I really appreciate it. We'll keep, yeah, well, Miles will be here. Uh, Anne is still here. Jamil's still here. I'm still here. <laughs> and I'm seeing some questions coming in or if, you, if folks have questions that they wanna have us answer live, uh, put them in the Q&A. We're happy to answer them. Um, do you want, Jamil, do you wanna to, jump in? I, no, I was gonna say, thank you, Miles. Uh, what you mentioned is important and from, your mouth to everyone else's ears. I hope this webinar really helps the next generation and is help those that's in school because I hear all too often that people are nervous to ask for help. And we want them to know that the help is there. 
we want you to know how to ask for it, the help, but the help is there. And from what you mentioned, it's so important. And that's why this webinar was created and so many amazing people involved. So, and Annie, Miles, the Q&A questions, please feel free to answer them how you see fit because I am not in higher education. <laughs> I just make sure that people get in touch with amazing leaders like yourself. So I think I we can, have the first I question. Can jump, I can jump in and, right. and, go, and go ahead. Go there, ahead. There, people want to know about money. Where can they get money? <laughs> where, can they, yes. where can they find scholarships? Um, so, and, and we can all kind of weigh in on this. I'll, I'll just pipe up first. So um, there, the, there are, in some spaces, there are condition specific. So if you have a specific condition like uh, cerebral palsy or spina bifida, through your foundations or associations, there might be college scholarships. If you have a spinal cord injury, um, there's a foundation called the Nielsen Foundation, and the Nielsen Foundation has 17 partner colleges. Um, you can find the information on the Nielsen Foundation's website, which Jamil is probably feverishly looking up right now, so we can pop that in the chat, um, or we can we can find it and put it uh, in the chat in a minute. But there are 17 colleges, um, and students can apply for scholarships through each of those individual institutions, not through the foundation. Um, so that could be a resource for people. Um, and the other thing to remember is that your state, whatever state you're in, might have funding available through vocational rehabilitation, uh, which is called different things in different places, but the state vocational rehabilitation program might have funding for students with physical disabilities, um, there might be funding through um, other federal programs as well. So, um, so, so yes, there might be scholarships and then there might be specific school scholarships at the individual institutions too. So Anne or Miles, did either of you have anything to add? Yeah, what you just said, Annie, is exactly what I would have said. Um, and make sure when you're doing those searches, especially um, if you're looking for a disability or diagnosis specific scholarship, that you put that into your search terms, you would be shocked how much money goes unclaimed every year simply because people don't apply for the scholarship because no one found it online. Um, I see a, a question on there that just says, do you offer scholarships? So I'm, if that was directed towards me, um, our university has academic related scholarships and need-based scholarships. Um, so if you are a Delaware resident and you graduate from a Delaware high school, as long as you have a 2.75 GPA, you can qualify for our um, Inspire scholarship, which is free tuition for all four years of your education. Uh, we also have a GAP scholarship that you could qualify for that would cover everything else. Um, and even if you're not a Delaware resident, you could qualify for other academic scholarships and need-based scholarships that we have. Um, the presidential scholarship, I think that the requirement for that is like a 3.5. Um, so it's a really reasonable um, GPA expectation for a, something that would be an entirely full ride scholarship. Um, so don't discount the academic um, piece there. Um, and we accept scholarships from any organization, government or otherwise. Um, and I know that in Delaware, the Division for Vocational Rehabilitation, like Annie was saying, um, does offer scholarship dollars for students with um, visible and invisible disabilities. There so, was um, there was yeah. a person who piped in with a question for Miles. So I'm, I'm putting a pin in that for a second because I want to ask that question. But I also wanted to mention that the Nielsen Foundation, if people are looking for that, the website is um, chnfoundation.org, great. It's actually in the chat now. Oh, good, so super. It's, it's there. Um, super. I also want people to know that it's important that if you have any question, I put in the chat for our information specialists. That's what they do specifically. They're there to help you if you have any questions to just reach out to them and contact them. But go ahead. There was, a, there was a question for Miles, and it was Miles, did you feel that the freshman orientations 
um, at university were helpful for you for you building strong relationships when you were starting college? Yeah, I was just in the process of responding to that, but it's probably better if I speak, if you know, I use my voice instead of texting it. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it's a, it can be, it's a, um, it's good for navigating you to resources more so. Um, it helps, you know, it's kind of like a college 101 sort of a thing, um, where to go, wh where to ask certain questions, um, knowing the difference between, uh, you know, your your major advisor and your college advisor. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a separate um, orientation for um, students with disabilities besides the general freshman orientation. The freshman orientation is kind of a madhouse uh, because it's not just you, it's not just freshmen, it's transfer orientation. It's usually the first week of school. So people are moving back in after, you know, flying from wherever to go back to college. So it's, um, you know, there's parents there, there's, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like a festival, to be honest. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, it's, a, you can, you know, you might end up meeting a friend there. Um, you might end up, because um, you're definitely going to meet people at the sea of people. Um, but um, I would say the best place, um, if I was looking at the question, um, the best place to really um, get any sort of strong relationships um, would be over time. You're gonna, you know, you're not gonna get that instantaneous um, um, relationship with someone on on day one. But uh, you might end up meeting somebody on day one, and then over time, you know, you you exchange messages because you have, you know, like interests, and then boom, there you go. So I want to just take a moment. If there was any question that we can answer again, please feel free to reach out to our information specialists. They are more than capable to answer all your questions. Um, but I want to give everyone a few seconds to just give a last word, last thought, and tell everybody how to find you past this <laughs> webinar. Okay, Annie, I'm going to move forward. Go ahead. Um, so people can find me at accessiblecollege.com. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. Um, and you can connect with me too. If you want to take advantage of the program I have with the Reeve Foundation, you can connect with me through the Reeve Foundation's uh, information specialist. Thanks. Um, and for me, um, if you go to the Delaware State University website, which is just www.desu, so um, D is in dog, E is in echo, S is in Sam, U is in university.edu, um, and search, frankly, you could just search disability where the first thing that's going to come up, and it's the Center for Disability Resources. All of our contact information is there, um, my email address, the phone number where you can reach me and where you can reach the rest of my staff. Um, they are all there. You can find us on IG or the gram, as my students call it, um, at, at um, DSU underscore CDR. Um, so we're posting on there all the time. We also are on Facebook. You can find us there. Um, but any questions you have, please feel free to reach out um, and we will be happy to answer them, um, offer you any pointers or advice, um, just like Annie was talking about. Go ahead, Ma. Go ahead, Miles. Yeah, yeah. And I, I actually just put my email in the chat if anybody wanted to um, hit me up for, you know, whatever advice, um, you know, tips about school. If they're thinking about coming up to Berkeley, you can definitely message me. Uh, my email is in the chat again. And um, uh, good luck on this adventure because it's definitely an adventure. A fun Thank one. Thank you, everyone. I am more than pleased for our community to really hear from all three of you. And if you have any questions or you want to get in contact with us at Reeve, feel free to contact me at jpayton at christopherreeves.org. Excuse me. Uh, you can find me there. All right. Thank you, everyone. And have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Bye.